Hi everyone, how are you? Nice seeing you. Thank you so much for coming. Nice to see you too, Rabbi. Chana Dvor Bat Miriam, Yoda Ben Miriam, Henia Bat Miriam, Verifka Bat Miriam. I should should give them a flash. Also, Benjamin Ben Mazalto, and there's another one, Benjamin Ben Brach. And Mir Ben Sara, Victor Bat Chana, Yeretz Gula Bat Chana, Kol Shalom Chak Bat Yisrael. Yeretz Bat Mazal. Amen. So this parsha is Parshat Ekev. A lot of interesting th stuff are written in the parasha, and I would like to uh, concentrate on appreciation. Many years ago, um, in Europe, there was this kingdom, and there was the king there that had only one son, and he really wanted him, uh, he wanted to prepare him, you know, for kingship. He wanted uh, to find an, 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 an advisor that will train him, that will prepare him, make him ready. And a lot of advisors came and, you know, to, you know, uh, offer themselves. And he was looking for a certain advisor that would have different fields of, you know, speciality. And he found one. This guy had three and major things that he was special in. He knew everything about horses, he knew everything about diamonds, and he knew everything about human beings, character traits, how to, you know, how to, uh, they call it... Um, Manicament? Huh? Manicament? No, 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 no. How to find out... The human side. What's, what's your person, what's your personality? and stuff, Pro to profile people, I should say, you know, how to profile people, so, um, so, yeah, so he was uh, accepted to this work, this advisor, one day, they had a sale for very good, uh, special horses, I don't know, Arabian horses, very good, so that you know, would fit uh, noblemen, uh, kings, uh, princes, and, 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 and all kind of officials and stuff. So he goes with them for the sale and uh, he checks and one of the sellers calls the prince and tells him, listen, this is such a good horse, I'm telling you, you you're going to enjoy it, you're going to ride it, it's fast, it's good, it, it's, oh, yeah, it's ancestor Paris, I don't know, it, it's a very good horse. So he believed in him and he wanted to buy, but the, his advisor said, hold on, I look at this horse and I see that after a while you could get very wild, you should be very, very careful. This horse is this type of horse that could, you know, throw you out of him and, and kill you, God forbid. So the prince tells the seller, can, can you demonstrate us, you know, what this horse can perform, maybe, you know, have a rider on him and we could see what he could do. Fine, he asked his helper or himself, went on top of this horse, and the horse, you know, was doing a nice route and everything, but towards the end, it really happened, whatever the advisor said, he started to get wild, he was jumping, he was, and then he threw this uh, rider away from him, and went back and even, you know, stamped on him and almost killed him. So the prince was shocked to see that, but from the other side, got excited. His advisor, he knows what he's saying. So he was really thankful to him. He told him, you know something? You saved me from death. He takes out from his pocket a $10 bill and he gives it to him. <laughs> A few weeks later, there was a big sale, a diamond sale, and they go together to see what they can buy, you know, what would fit him as the prince. And they check the merchandise and they check all the uh, diamonds and, and the jewelry displayed there. They check and he saw something brilliant, something so nice, something big, nice, that he thought it would fit him. He wants to take it, but the advisor said, hold on, let me check. He does his own checks, you know, I guess they, the uh, specialists, they know how to check uh, diamonds. And he told him, 
That's not a real diamond. This is just it's like a, a type of a, well, a glass or something or a CZ, whatever. It's not. And yes, yeah, so he saved him a lot of money. You know, each diamond is supposed to be, I don't know how many thousands and thousands of dollars. He, he saved him so much. He said, you really know your stuff. He took out another small bill from his pocket and he gives it to him. Okay. Then, as they ride back home, he tells the advisor, you know something? I see that you really know your job. You really know what you're doing. You showed, you proved me how you're excellent in knowing about horses and about diamonds. Let's see, uh, how, how about the third specialty of yours, you know, profiling people. Can you profile me? Can you tell what kind of character traits I, I have, what kind of personality I have? Or, or the advisor comes closer to him and whispers in his ears and he tells him, you are not really a prince. He says, what are you talking about? He says, you are, there's a word for um, somebody that you take from the streets, how do you call it? A beggar. Uh, or a homeless. homeless. A homeless beggar, something. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you were a small kid, you know, when you, when you were small. Orphan. Or, and and, and, and you, you're, the king just brought you home. You are not a real prince. Really? How could you know that? How could you say that? So he went straight to his father and he asked him, tell me the truth. Am I your son or not? So the father, he confessed to his child that him and the queen didn't have children. And once they saw him and they felt pity and they took, brought them home. But then they, they thought, you know, who's going to inherit our kingdom and everything? They decided that we'll make him a, a king, uh, uh, to bring him over and raise him, and uh, hopefully later on he's going. That's why they, they have this advisor that will, you know, help him and train him and prepare him. He went back to the advisor. How did you know? Are you a prophet? No one knows the secret in, in the whole kingdom. How do you know that? He says, No, I'm not a prophet. But let me tell you something. When I save your life. Okay? Instead of really appreciating and thinking, what you give me? Something worthless, a ten dollar bill, what is this? And then I save you from a big scam, from a big amount of money, you know? And again you took out a small bill and you give it to me. A real king does not act cheap like that. That's what he told me. A real king does not act like cheap. Our Pasha speaks so much about appreciating, okay? We have here the Achalta v'savata uverachta. Don't forget to bless Hashem, uh, yeah, to thank Hashem after all whatever He gave you. We have a pasuk that says, V'amarta bilvavcha, kochi v'otzim edi asali t'chayel azeh, you know? All my wealth, all my my strength, my power is because of me. I I gave, I tried, I did, I, I I'm successful, it's because of me. And all kind of other sentences that we have here that teaches us here that all the mitzvot that were given to us as Jews, okay, are um, so that Hashem, Hashem promises us that if the Jewish people are going to fulfill the mitzvot, He's going to give them so much reward, He's going to give them so much panasa, so much abundance, so much uh, health, and, and, and kids, and blessings, and bacha, and this, and this, and this, okay? But, um, but let's, 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 I'll go now to the next story and, and we'll develop it even more. There was this guy by the name of Robert Borens or something like that. He was raised in Bayside, New York, and um, he learned in a public school, didn't know so much about Jewish religion, didn't know. And uh, the, uh, so the father used to send him to, to a Hebrew school, you know, once or twice a week he would go and learn some, some Judaism, but Mainly, not more than that. When uh, 
um, when his uh, grandfather passed away, this was the first time that he saw his father going to shul, going to synagogue, to say Kaddish, you know, for, for, for the memory of his grandfather. And, uh, and he saw that the father was really persistent. He was going every week. He was saying the Kaddish. He was saying the prayers and everything. And he didn't understand. He was a small kid. He didn't understand by that time the importance of it or what is it exactly, what's the meaning of it. No, but then it's passed and that's it. And then, since his bar mitzvah, this uh, rabbi, he never went to shul. He doesn't know anything. He forgot, basically, about Judaism and, and everything. He didn't practice it. And then, one day, his father got a sudden heart attack. And he went quickly to the hospital to visit him. And his father's last wish to him was, please say Kaddish after me. Fine, of course, he, he promised his father. And when he went to Shul to say the Kaddish, you know, it's Aramaic words, you don't even understand what you say. So the rabbi was there, he met the rabbi, he says, Rabbi, what does it mean, this Kaddish, that people say after, after the deceased? He told him, this is your commitment as a Jew, you know, we, this is your connection to, to Judaism, we have to keep the 613 laws that Hashem gave us in the Torah, in Hasina, and this, he says, you have 613 laws? <laughs> what is this? He told me, Mira, you can learn it soon, we're going to have a, a, a class for Chumash, we're going to, oh, what is a Chumash? He didn't know. So the rabbi told him, you know, come later, I'll explain you, I'll talk to you. And, and he was really interested, and a few times the rabbi invited him over to his Shabbat, to his home for Shabbat. So this is how he got a little bit, you know, interested and kept the Kaddish for his father and, and, and started. That year, it says, that America started to uh, enlist people uh, according to their um, age, according to their calendar, uh, the, the date of birth, to, to the army. And uh, he also wanted to contribute uh, his, you know, himself to the, to the country. And uh, he came to the rabbi to say his goodbyes because he's about to leave to, to South Carolina or somewhere for, you know, for training because he needs to, you know. So, they went. so he asked the rabbi, rabbi, I won't be able to perform mitzvot in, in the army. Tell me one mitzvah that I can take upon myself and hopefully I'll try to keep it. One mitzvah, I cannot really more. So, what kind of mitzvah is going to give you Shabbat, Kashrut, Filin? Everything is hard. It's, it's, it's in the 50s or 60s. Or, uh, so you told him, you know something? I'll give you a small, easy mitzvah. It won't require so much from you. Do netilat yadayim before you, you, you eat the bread. You know, wash your hands before you eat the bread. Say, say a bracha. He says, okay, I'll do that. No problem. And as long as he was still here in the United States, it wasn't really a big deal. He would always find water, would wash his hands and everything. But then they were sent to Vietnam. Oh, wow. And uh, over there, uh, still, you know, he was able to keep it. You know, people didn't really pay attention. And he tried to do it in a way that people won't realize what is he doing. It was restrained to... Whole, uh, wash your hands before uh, f the food and, and say a blessing. And then one day, uh, six months after he came to Vietnam, his group, his, uh, his, his army base, his, his place, they were uh, doing a sudden late or night attack against the Viet Cong, Vietnamese. The, the Vietnamese. And, um, and they, and they get there, and as they get into there, they started to shoot on them. They started to shoot on them. It's a whole big battle. Shooting, shooting, shooting on one each other. Okay, the whole day they were shooting, shooting. And then there was a rest. This fire for some reason or something, some kind of... They, they were hungry. They didn't eat the whole day long. They wanted to eat something. They started eating. So this guy, Ravi, wanted to eat something. And then you remember, wait, I have to wash hands. Where should I find... People told him that they saw a, st a, a stream of water some less than half a mile away. It's dangerous now. 
the enemy is there. But he said, you know, something, a farm is the rabbi, and this also for the Elui Neshama of my father, you know, for to elevate his, his, his soul in heaven. I'll try. He started to crawl quietly, quietly towards that uh, wow. water there to wash his hand. And he's going and going and going slowly, slowly. He got to the water. He was so happy. He washed his hands. He said the blessing. And now he's about to go back, to crawl back to his camp, to, to where his friends were. All of a sudden, out of the out of nowhere, the, the Vietnamese again started to shoot his 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 friends. The shooting train he cannot really continue, cannot go. So he had to wait in his hiding place until you know it will quiet down. When it quiet, when it all quiet down, there was no place to return oh. to anymore. All his friends, Leno, were killed. They just killed all of them, shoot all of them. A mitzvah that he took upon himself, protected him. Protected him in that area in Vietnam so many years ago. And uh, it's unbelievable when we do a mitzvah, you know, it's... Uh, Here, like it's close by, we're on bash. Right? <laughs> you know, yeah. we make a big deal. <laughs> Sometimes we don't want to eat bread yeah. just not to wash. I even not I okay, eat on okay, Friday just. <laughs> bread just not to wash. So. So what happens when we, it says in this Pasha, Kadosh Puri gives us the mitzvot leman anotcha lenasotcha to test us. Ladat at Hashem be'orah hatishmo mitzvotav olo Hashem wants to test us. Rav Mazuz, the Rosh Yeshiva of of Yeshiva Kisar Chavim, he said a story that he heard in Tunisia. He came from Tunisia. He said that. Um, that it says in our parasha, a pasuk that says, uh, I said it before, it's all because of me. Uh, you know, I became strong, I became successful. And um, so there was this guy that um, he made some money and he, 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 he started thinking, you know, it's a waste of time to go to shul every morning. Why should I go and pray in a minyan? I don't have the time, I have to open my store, I have a lot of customers, I have a lot of things to do, a lot of things on my top of my head. So he decided not to go to Minya and he's going to pray at home. He started to pray at home. After a while, he didn't even have time for that, he would put his feet in right away and, and continue to his job, to his, to his store. And after a while, he also stopped with this. Slowly, 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 even Shabbatot, he stopped going to Shul. Basically, no praying anymore, no thank you, no more than no nothing. His wife was a tzaddiki. She used to tell him a few times, come on, uh, go to shul, it's so important, this and that. He wouldn't do it. Once the rabbi met her, there was some kind of occasion, he met her. He says, where is your husband? I don't see him lately. He says, what can I do? He doesn't go to pray. He's so busy in his job. So the rabbi said, okay, next morning, early in the morning, I don't know what it was, four o'clock in the morning or something, he knocks at the house, the rabbi. The husband opens, he sees the rabbi. He mm -hmm. says, Rabbi, what are you doing here? Come, I came to take you to, to, to the Minyan, where I was shul. So for his honor, you know, he went with him. He went with him, he stayed, and after the Minyan finished, he went to his store. Came some messengers or servants from the, from the palace. They, they, they have a king there a palace, they bought a lot of merchandise. They were so happy, they buy a lot of merchandise. They bought, they bought, they bought, put it on, on wagons, and now he tells them, okay, so now you have to give me the payment. He say, shame on you. We just gave you a payment, and you want a double portion? You want to take us double the amount? He says, what? He couldn't say, it's the king. What he would tell them, he's going to start fighting with them. So he took all the merchandise and left without even paying. He got so upset, he went back to his wife in the evening, he tells her, you see what happens to me, one day I go to me and see what happens. <laughs> Next day in the morning, again, four o'clock, the rabbi knocks on his door, come on, let's go to shul. Okay, he didn't want to, he felt embarrassed, whatever, the rabbi is coming to me, whatever, he went with him. And then after they finished their prayer, he went again to his store. That day, a woman comes, very, very respected woman from the community. She comes, she buys and buys and buys and buys and buys, fill up all her 
uh, they load all her wagons and everything. She ran away, she didn't even pay. He got so furious. So maybe the second day he comes to his wife. He says, see what happens when I go to shul, see what happens. And, and he decided that this night, okay, he's going to go earlier from the house. He won't let the rabbi, you know, drag him to, to the shul again. So he got up half an hour earlier, you know, to run away from the rabbi. He opens the door to get, to get out, <laughs> the rabbi is there. <laughs> ah! Come on, we have a shiur now. Shiur? Yeah, Zohar, Mishnah, this and that. I want you, I want you to come with me. To, hi, halfa, halfa, whatever you say. He went with him, felt embarrassed. They stayed there for the shoe and then for the prayer. And then they went to this store and he says to himself, what kind of damage is going to be today, you know? So comes a nice uh, young official. And he orders and he orders and he orders and he orders a lot of stuff. And he says, to himself, okay, what now? What's going to happen now? And then he tells him, you know something? I didn't order uh, wagons to come and, and I don't have where to put it. Let me leave all the merchandise over here, I'm going to find, you know, someone that will be able to pick up all the stuff for me and to bring it to wherever I need, and then I'll, I'll you know, I'll pay and everything. He says, at least he leaves the merchandise here, okay. So he went, and he didn't come back. He waits for him one hour, two hours, three hours, the whole day passed, he didn't come back. What should I do? He wants to close his store. But he saw that he left his wallet in there. This official left his wallet in there, full of money there. He says, okay, he probably will come back, he will need it. So he said, okay, I'll put it in my pocket and I'll save it for him whenever he comes. He closed the store, locked everything, went home. And on the way, he meets the rabbi. The rabbi tells him, I see that you got a nice profit today. He says, <laughs> rabbi, what are you talking about? He says, you have in your, in your pocket a lot of profit, right? He says, so he told him what happened. He said, I'll tell you something. When somebody wants to make a change in his life, you want to start to pray in Minyan, Hashem will send you a lot of tests. The first day he sent you the evil inclination himself, the Satan. He mentioned the name. You, I came and I picked you up and you came with me, you prayed, everything was okay. Second day he sent the female, uh, the, we mentioned the name, we won't mention the name. And so, you went with me to shul. Third day, you know, it's so important. Would you, you know, give in or not? I can make sure that I'm going to take you. Then, because you came with me the third time, or read the third time is a chazaka already, so they sent Eliyahu Navi. And Eliyahu Navi, when he comes, he does only good. The first one, they took the merchandise, they ran away, or whatever. They, they made you a loss, they made you a damage. This one uh, gave you a prophet. He said, what prophet? What are you talking about? He's going to come, and uh, I will have to pay, pay him back uh, to give it back. It's, it's his money. He says, he's not going to come back. And check how much money you have in, in, in the world. Exactly. He checks and he sees that exactly the same that money that he lost for the first and the second day, uh, with the third, he, he, he got it all. So this is what uh, the rabbi said. He said, the rabbi basically said, Hashem is testing us. Every time you try to do a mitzvah, you want to take upon yourself to keep tzniut. You want a longer skirt or you know, there's a wedding and it's so hard for you to, to, to match a dress or to match this because you took upon yourself and Hashem tests you and I want, Hashem wants to check you. You took upon yourself not to speak Lashon Ara. That day you have an event. That day you meet a Always. friend that you didn't. Or somebody calls. Right? And then uh, this is how Hashem tests you. You want to keep Shabbat and you want to, or anything you want to take upon yourself, Hashem tests you right away. It's hard, it's not easy. So, uh, another thing that uh, it says in the parasha, what does Hashem want from you? Hashem wants you to uh, fear Him. To go in his way, to worship, to pray to Hashem, because we know that avoda is a tefillah. Today we don't have the holy temple, we don't sacrifice sacrifices. Working Hashem is prepare ourselves for praying and praying Hashem. This is what we're supposed to do uh, today. 
and see when you pray something how a prayer helps it's unbelievable so um, there was a, an orphan uh, in in sons and um, he was poor he didn't have money and he was supposed to get married and that year that he was supposed to get married a plague, epidemic started in that town, little town. People started to die there. And there's a sgula. Sgula is like this kind of uh, pre-natural something, a marriage that you have to do. That if you put together an uh, orphan, a boy and a girl, and you marry them off, and you pay all the expenses of the wedding, you know, you buy them the housing, you, you, you pay you know, all the dowry and all this, you know, so this decree that was on top of this uh, community, okay, Hashem sends them, Hashem forgives them, and, and they don't have it, and, and you know, this, uh, it cancels the, the, the problem, the, the, the plague, or the epidemic, and the whole thing. They did that, and it really stopped, okay? So, um, and in their Shema Brachot of this uh, orphan boy and girl, Rabbi Mitzans came to talk, and he said, he told them a story, there was this uh, orphan uh, boy and uh, girl that were working for a certain innkeeper. And he offered them a place to sleep, okay? And also, he gave them a nice amount of money, salary. And so they told him, if we have already a nice salary and a place to sleep and you give us all the expenses and everything, please, if it's possible, save the money by you, we, we have no place where they didn't have banks at that time, please save us the money. So he said fine, he saved them and it collected and collected and collected. After a while, a few years working by him, he lost all his money. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't pay them. And of course, this money went too. And so they told him, they forgave him, they said okay, we understand, so I'm or whatever. And he released them, and they went to find another another inn. They worked for this another inn. Another, the same kind of arrangement. Uh, you keep the money by, by you, you know, and please save it for us. He said, okay, he's going to save it for them. And then, uh, a few years passed, and then came to him one day to the, to the inn, their former employer, beggar looks for some charity and, and they felt so merciful this uh, orphan boy and girl and uh, the guy is offering the girl maybe we would give him all whatever we earned already because he really needs that and maybe he can find open a business maybe he can his luck is going to change and it's going to start all over he said but i saved money to get married he's going to get married with me without any dowry without any money without anything he said i'll marry you she said, okay. They gave him, poor girl, and poor, everything that they had, they gave him. In heaven, they sh the heavens were shook up, they were shaken, because of such a great uh, heroic mitzvah that these poor people did, okay? And so, uh, they wanted to reward them, okay? So, um, um, so they they said that uh, some say it's about the uh, Parshemto. I read it here. It's about the Rabbi El They, you know, they were very spiritual people, and they felt that something like that happens in that in that little town. So the rabbi said to his students, "Let go and marry off this uh, orphan and an orphan girl." They come to that city and they tell them, "You want to get married now?" They said, "Okay." Okay, let's make a chuppah. They make a chuppah, and in the Sheva Brachot, the rabbi gets up and he says, I want to give to the Chatana Kala a, a, a blessing. I want to give them all this estate wow. as a present for the wedding. Okay. <laughs> Another student of his gets up and he says, I want to give them $1,000, which was a big amount of money. That's fine. Other one gets up and says, I want to give them the whole meal, they said it was a meal where they would grind the, 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 the flour, the whatever. Okay, it, it, I guess, brings a lot of profit, a lot of money. And one gets up, 
I want to give them the in. I want to give them. They, they get blessings and blessings. So them. After the Shem Rachot, the bride and groom, they want to take a walk. And there was this uh, forest surrounding this uh, estate. They want to, they, they go there and then they hear somebody cries for help, help, help. The guy runs to see what's the problem. A guy was, was drowning into a swamp. Hmm. And so he didn't know how to save him. He threw he, his belt, he threw to him so that he will catch oh, it. No. He oh. caught it and he was able to pull him and he was saving him. So where, where should I take you? You're, you're all dirty and cold and this. Please take me to my father. Who is your father? He is the landowner of all this estate. Wow. Okay. Uh, he goes to him, he takes him there. And uh, this guy was supposed to get married. This Goy, sons of the parents of the landowner. And he wanted to bring them, uh, he wanted to go to the forest to hunt some nice, uh, I don't know, bird or animal, something to, for them to eat at that. Uh, wedding that they did and uh, his horse was stuck into the swamp and, and, and he was almost drowning there so they come and the father and the parents and they were all there they were the whole family they're all rich wealthy people so they were so happy so the father says I'm going to give you as a present the whole estate <laughs> so the rabbi's blessing became a reality <laughs> the other one says I'll give you a thousand dollars this one says I'll give you the meal this one says I'll give you the inn this one you know, wow. and they really got all these Some all these blessings. Wow. They really got that from one deed that they did, a special wow. mitzvah that they did. Basically, the rabbis, what he did here, he continued. We said that whenever we want to pray, right? We have to connect geula latfila. We say Baruch Hashem Gaal Israel, and then we start Shmonaisa. Okay. When you connect geula redemption to the tefila. The, the possibilities, the, the energies, the, 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 there's much more chances that Hashem is going to fulfill your wishes. Here, the rabbis, he, the rabbis, what they did there, they connected the previous uh, chasadim, kindness of Hashem, to continue this kindness to the future. This is what they did. And this is so beautiful, you know, to do. So, um, so this is what we do. As we, as we, uh, use this principle, you know, to put the geula and the tefila together. In this parasha, we say Kriyat Shema, okay? And uh, Kriyat Shema is something that we say three, four times a day. We say Kriyat Shema before we sleep. We get, uh, constantly, we say all the time. And um, this is the tefila. We're talking here about the prayer, how to get connected to Hashem about 200 years ago in the city of Izmir in Turkey, Turkey. There was a very important man, by the uh, rabbi by the name Rabbi Eliyahu Cohen. That's all. Rabbi Eliyahu Cohen. Every time he used to pray, his prayer was so, so special. He would get so much excited as he would pray, okay? And he would prepare himself for the prayer also. Now, I don't know if you know, but some Hasidim, they put a galton, they put uh, this kind of uh, belt? material belt, right, to separate, you know, two parts of the body. They put this, and so he was looking for that. He, he always used to do it. It was Milcha Kam, Kam Tfilaf Milcha, he wanted to pray. He didn't find it. Then he saw something black on the, on the floor, on the ground. He picked it up, he put it around him, and started praying. He prays and prays and prays and all getting excited and everything. When he finished, he wanted to open it up and to release it. As he opens it up, it released by itself and jumped from his oh, body and went to the ground and somehow twisted and ran away. Snake? <laughs> Apparently it was a snake. Oh my gosh. The snake, that's a big miracle because this would stay still, didn't move, didn't do anything, waited for him to finish. But see how he prepared himself for the tefillah. He didn't even pay attention because he was so absorbed, he was so thinking and yeah, concentrating. He didn't even pay attention. What is he picking up? 
It's interesting. Uh, they, he wrote a book afterwards to commemorate this miracle that happened to him, and the book is called Ezor uh, Eliyahu. Eliyahu Navi, he was recognized also by the Ezor that he used to wear. Uh, mm -hmm. he, uh, some, some kind of thing, uh, whatever, it's something nice. So, this prayer is like a, a personal pipe from Hashem to you, a personal connection. It's a special time when we can ask whatever we want. And um, it says about Rabbi Akiva from Egan, was a big girl, he lived in a town that's called Pozna. And um, one day, through that city, passed by a whole delegation of the king. And uh, that day, there was a very sick person in that city. And they saw this delegation, they say, probably the personal doctor of the king is there. Maybe we can ask his opinion, how can he treat this uh, patient? Maybe he could cure him. They come to him, the doctor comes, he checks him and he tells them, it's a very rare uh, disease. And for this, he needs a rare uh, cure, but he he will he won't be able to we will won't be able to cure. There's nothing to do. Rabbi Akiva says, "How can you say there's nothing? If God forbid the king would become sick, would you tell him there's nothing to do?" He says, "No. If it would be the king, there is a cure, but for a simple people cannot get it. There is a very very rare bird." that lives in one of the forests. That if the king would become sick, I would have to send special soldiers, special people with weapons that will go into that forest, fight against all the wild animals that there is there. Look for this bird, look for it, try it, hunt it, get it. Come back to the main city and I will check it. Maybe it's not even the bird that I need. They, they might go again to look for it. Simple people, we cannot do it for simple. So yeah, it's incurable. I can't really help you with that. And they left. Rabbi Akiva said, "Yeah, I'll pray to Hashem." He gets into his chambers and starts praying for the for Ashlama, for the chole, and he prays for him, and he prays, and he prays, and he prays. As he prays, they hear something from the roof, from the chimney. Something is rattling, making a noise. Something gets there. So the rabbi tells his, his, uh, his, uh, his somebody in the household, uh, go and check what's in the room, what is this noise? He goes up and, and he saw that there's, there was a very, a very weird bird stuck in the chimney. Wow. So he takes this down, the, the bird, and he shows it to the rabbi, this was making... The rabbi says, wait a second, that's a very interesting uh, bird. And as he says, why did Hashem bring this bird? Probably it's that bird that the doctor was talking about. He told, uh, he told him, quickly go to the people, you know, where the sick person is. Tell them to uh, to kill it, to, uh, prepare it. To, to prepare it, to make soup out of it. And, and they should, he should drink the water of the soup slowly, slowly, exactly like the doctor said. Okay, and please pluck some feathers and keep it and hide it and keep it in a safe place. It's fine. They did all whatever he did, and the guy got healed. Months later, the doctor came to to Pozna, and he was interested. What happened to that sick person? He went to ask people. They say he's alive. He's fine. He's alive. How could this be? They say, yeah, we treated him, the right told us exactly what to do. We found this weird uh, uh, fly, uh, no fly, a bird, and we treated him with this. Can I see, do you have something, you have leftover? Yeah, we have some uh, feathers. They show him the feathers, say, yeah, yeah, that's... It's amazing, how could the rabbi, with his prayer, get whatever, even if the king will send somebody to find that, to fetch that bird, not always they will find it. Sometimes they will have to do two trips, three trip, trips until the. And here's the rabbi with one small prayer was able to get it. It's amazing, you know, what we could do without philo. Yeah. So uh, let's go back. You know, I started with appreciation with the first story about the guy, the advisor to the king. They told him 
the fact that you don't know how to appreciate it shows that you're low. Hashem teaches us through all kinds of mitzvot that we have in our Torah who we are, where we came from, and how much we owe everything for Hashem. You know, in this Pasha we read Pasha Kachma. When do we say it? Usually. A guy say it with the tefillin, the tefillin, the kiddush, the tzitzit. All these tefillot, all these mitzvot that we have is to remember where you came from. From Egypt. We were slaves there. We couldn't do it without Hashem. Okay? So it's basically, you know, we have to keep rem reminding ourselves that we owe everything to Hashem. Listen, appreciating it's something that people don't like. No one likes to owe people for favors that people did for them. No one wants to feel this heavy feeling like I owe you everything and, 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 and no one likes it. And so naturally people want to think that they are superior, that they give, that they don't like to feel this burdensome feeling like, you know, I have to give him, I owe something. And, um, and, um, and uh, so sometimes there are some people that tend to ignore all kind of favors that people do to them or to minimize them. It's a big deal. It didn't really, it didn't get out of his way to, his way to help me. It was convenient. He did it for his own sake. Uh, he didn't do it just for me. These are people, all kind of things they like to say. And it's not true. A woman needs to appreciate her husband whenever he provides. Yes, it's his job to bring money to the house. But still, you know, you cannot say, but, but you have to. What do you mean? If you have this kind of an attitude, it doesn't really lead you nowhere. Instead, telling him something like, I appreciate the fact that you try, I appreciate the fact that, you know, the house is always full, there's nothing missing in the house, and, and, and you truly... It, it, if the husband doesn't respect or, or treats his wife or appreciates his wife for the fact that she cleans and she cooks and she irons his shirts and, and she, you know, yes, it's her job, but, you know, if he doesn't appreciate, how do you feel? You also, you yeah. know? Everyone wants to feel appreciated, and so if the husband um, appreciates his wife and says it in words, and the wife does the same to the husband, you know what happens? The kids will grow yeah. up to be appreciating people. Because now that you don't take things for granted, okay? You don't have to, no one has to. And, and, and it's so important to educate the kids. In this parasha we say, Veshinantam levanecha vedivarta ba maza veshinantam levanecha. This is education. We have to educate them. We have to teach them the Torah, the Torah values, which these are so, so important things, you know, to appreciate. And so uh, it says, Kol hakufer betovato shel chavero, whoever denies doesn't appreciate whatever the favors and all the kindness that his friend was doing that to them, eventually is going to lichpov betovato shel makom. All what Hashem gives you, you take it for granted too, and you think it's because of you. It's not because of Hashem helped you, okay? It's not because of Hashem kindness. And so, um, and so, um, we have to uh, teach our children, okay, that, um, that they didn't get it out of the... Somebody was investing in them. Somebody, somebody was working on them and helping them and they did stuff to them. Um, I want to tell you a very, very strong story. Haridvaz. Haridvaz was Rabbi Yaakov David Vilovsky. Okay? He passed away about 100 years ago. And in his late years, he lived in Tzfat. He came from Europe and he lived in Tzfat. One day, it was supposed to be his father's yurtzeit. And uh, it was a very cold, wintry day, snowy, cold, like I don't know what. And he needed to go to shul for the yurtzeit, because he needed to say Kaddish and everything. So he came there. People didn't go out in the streets because it was so cold. He came to the show and he was waiting, waiting, no one came. Meanwhile, he remembered his father and started to tear and started to cry. Slowly, slowly, people gathered and they saw the rabbi is crying. They say, Rabbi, 
we know that it's your father, you always have your father, but he passed already, for, already many years ago. Why are you still crying? He says, you don't know what my father did to me. And he started telling that his father, his job was to build ovens. Now, those years, the oven used to be the main part of the house. It was a heater. It was an oven. Mm -hmm. It was people would cook there. People would, everything, you know, everything was was there. And in, in those cold winters and everything, it, it's, it's so important. So that, there was this one year when he was a child that they were lacking cement and they were lacking uh, some other building uh, materials and uh, he couldn't really build uh, ovens because they, they didn't have this stuff. So he didn't have an income. For three months he wasn't able to pay tuition for the special Rebbe that he hired to teach his son. It was the best Rebbe and they would give any amount for their, their son, their advice to, to grow up and to become a, a, a big man, a big rabbi. But they felt bad uh, after three months when the, the, the rabbi didn't get his money, he sent them a note. He told them, I can't really, you know, teach your son. I have, I have my expenses too. So, um, so, uh, they felt bad, they didn't know what to do. Okay, fine, the, uh, the father went to shul that night. And in shul, he heard that a very rich man complains about the fact that there's no building materials, they lack it. And he says, I'm building now a house for my son, he needs to get married, and he doesn't have a heater, what should I do? And he kept complaining to his friends. He went back to, uh, how, to his house and he asked his wife, what do you say? Maybe I will dis, um, dis, dis, uh, disassemble right, our oven and I build it by the rich man's house and he'll pay me and I'll be able to pay you know, the tuition. She says, it's a cold winter. What should we do afterwards? She says, well, what should we do? We have to pay him. So Mamash be Mesirut never saw self sacrifice and she says, she said, okay. And he started to brick after brick to, to remove it, to remove it slowly, slowly. The whole evening he was working on it. And then he went to the rich man's house and he built there the oven, the heater, brick after brick took him and he paid him a nice amount. Quickly he went and, and he paid it to, to the rabbi. That year, I told you, it was a very, very cold year and it was hard. And he remembered how they were shivering, how it was cold, how it, it was hard for them to go to sleep because there was no heater in the house. And he remembered that his parents did all this for his education, so that he's going to grow and become a big time with Chacham. He said, before I, went to, I came to Shul, the Rebaz now in his late years, he says, I was thinking to myself, it's such a cold weather, it's snowy, maybe I shouldn't go. But then I remembered, what my father did for me, my mother, how they were willing to suffer all this cold weather just that I will become a Talmud Chacham. Now I won't pay my respects to my, to, to, my, to my father and I won't go to the shul to say Kaddish. This is why I was crying. This is when people understand what does it mean to educate, to, ch to teach children and to tell them, don't take things for granted. Nothing just comes from, uh, from, from, from the sky, just like that. You know, we invest in you, and we give you, and we want you to become good people, appreciating people. This is what Moshe basically gives rebuke to Amisai. Let's hope and pray that Be'ezat Hashem, we will see a lot of nachat from our children, Be'ezat Hashem, they'll grow to become big family. Amen. Uh, thank you so much. God bless you. Amen. 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 Beautiful. Beautiful.